The College Board cuts our David story off with the oath of the Horati in 1785, which is just before the French Revolution breaks out and just before David's story and France's starts getting a lot more interesting and a whole lot bloodier. So here is another of David's French Revolution paintings submitted to the French Academy after the National Assembly had met and called for a new constitution and after the Paris mob stormed the Paris prison, the Bastille. I could really imagine this work or the death of Socrates that we saw earlier showing up in an attribution question. Both paintings have a classical theme, a contemporary political message, and David's characteristic linear composition and use of classical architectural features. Here again, David's classically educated viewers would have known the story. Brutus's sons had attempted to overthrow the Roman Republic and restore the monarchy. So the father ordered his own sons to be executed as an act of loyalty to the Republic. The message was pretty clear. Be prepared to sacrifice everything for the revolution, even your near and dear. As political predictions go, this one was spot on. The tennis court oath that we saw in the last class represented an all too brief moment of national unity. In the years that followed, an increasingly radical faction took power in France, sending anyone who disagreed or had even the slightest association with the aristocracy into the deadly embrace of Madame Guillotine. David threw in with this crowd, led by Maximilien Robespierre and Jean-Paul Marat, and in fact, he became their official minister of propaganda. So here's a sketch that David made standing at an upstairs window, watching the revolutionary troops lead Queen Marie Antoinette off to the guillotine. As a member of the convention, France's ruling legislature at the time, he had actually voted for her execution. After knocking off this sketch, David raced to a ceremony to unveil a work the convention had commissioned from him, a tribute to one of their members, the recently assassinated Jean-Paul Marat. By the way, the rise of the terror, the assassination of Marat, and an analysis of the painting we're about to see, which is probably David's most famous work, even though it's not any longer on the list, all of these feature in the Simon Shama video. We don't have time, but again, I highly recommend the entire video. This painting is a propaganda piece, one of the most brilliant in the history of art. Marat suffered from a disfiguring skin disease, and David's painting, The Skin, has mostly cleared miraculously. The note that the dead Marat is clutching is not the note that the young assassin, Charlotte Corday, sent him in order to gain an audience. Her note contained a list of supposed traitors begging to lose their heads. Instead, David has painted Marat clutching a letter to a poor widow, offering Marat's help and financial assistance, a letter that David fabricated to win more sympathy for Marat. Moreover, David has deliberately borrowed Christian imagery to convey martyrdom. The French Revolution at this point has repudiated Christianity. But the resemblance to Michelangelo's Pietà is no accident. Note that all those Roman architectural features have disappeared. We just have that experience Bands of swirling space, is it perhaps a vision of eternity for David's secular sacrificed Christ? When the head-chopping phase of the revolution ended with the execution of its leader, Robespierre, David came very close to making personal acquaintance with Madame Guillotine. He was imprisoned, but eventually pardoned. After this near brush with death and a short period of exile, he transferred his loyalties to France's new demagogue, Napoleon, and once again took up his paintbrush in the service of propaganda. Ever obedient to his new master, David made several changes to this painting at Napoleon's request. Uh, for example, he painted the Pope with his hand raised in blessing, which is historically quite dubious. Originally, David had painted the disgruntled Pope with his hands in his lap. And get a load of this highly romanticized and highly unlikely vision of Napoleon riding a bucking horse a along a steep, icy precipice in the Alps. But we'll leave David now, but not Napoleon. On to Goya, the Napoleonic Wars and Romanticism. Okay, don't panic. We're going to cover these points as we go along. So think of this slide as the first glance at the map you make before that maddening Google lady's voice starts telling you which way to turn. 
So I've talked many times about how each artistic generation likes to rebel against the older generation, and Romanticism is no exception. All that emphasis on pure reason struck many artists of the next generation as cold and unfeeling, especially after so many from their parents' generation who worshipped allegedly at the altar of reason proved distressingly willing to spill a whole lot of blood in its name. But the call for liberty, equality, and fraternity nevertheless resonated with them, igniting a passion for freedom, which many Romantic poets and artists interpreted as much uh, as as freedom from political tyranny as freedom from society's rules. Of course, Enlightenment thinking already included what would prove to be a strong Romantic element represented by Rousseau. Up until now, this emphasis on feelings and freedom had shown up mostly in naturalistic landscapes and portraits or in sentimental paintings of simple peasant families, or as we saw with Hogarth in satire. But now painters began to explore the scary underbelly of feelings and emotions, nightmares, the macabre, beauty that was more unearthly than real, all summed up, as your homework noted, in the term sublime. Nature to the Romantics wasn't just a source of beauty, it was also a source of terror. And for many, it was an allegory for the bestiality that humans were proving very willing to visit on one another. Romantic art also saw a return to Baroque-style theatricality, a longing for what seemed the simpler and more religious days of the Middle Ages, and a revulsion against the perceived ugliness of industrialization, and we'll get there. I usually save these summary slides for the end, but I put it up front because now I want to backtrack and look at an artist whose career really mirrored the move from aristocratic Rococo to Enlightenment rationalism to Romantic sublime and horror, and the artist is Goya. You probably gather that I'm not crazy about David. I find his paintings brilliant, but cold and fanatical. My opinion doesn't matter, of course, except that you should be aware of my prejudices. In that spirit, be warned, I really, really like Goya, another man crush alert. Francisco de Goya started out as a court painter. This painting is one of the many tap designs he did for the Royal Tapestry Works. Aside from the Spanish Mantillas, this could have been a work by Vato or Fragonard. Of course, since the patrons were the more conservative Spanish, the girls kept their clothes on. Goya's designs caught the eye of the Spanish royal family, and here we see a famous Goya portrait of Charles IV, his very bossy wife, who, together with her lover really ruled Spain and their many children. Just a few quick points of comparison with Velazquez's famous court portrait. Uh, the Goya uh, portrait is not a required work, but we see similarities in the use of light and shadow, in the paintings in the background, the loose brush strokes that capture particularly the sumptuous fabrics. But note that Las Meninas is all about the artist's intimacy with the royal family, Goya puts himself into his royal portrait as well, but he hides himself in the shadows. I've circled his face because otherwise you could easily miss it. And maybe he was right to hide. Goya barely bothered to disguise his disdain for his royal patrons. We know from Goya's writings that he found the Spanish royal family self-indulgent, irresponsible, and unprepared to meet the challenges that the French Revolution and then Napoleon's invasion would pose to Spain. So, are these Enlightenment works or are they Romantic works? Uh, the etching on the right used to show up all the time on AP exams. It's been replaced with an etching from his other famous series, and I'll get there in a moment. But these are important transitional works in the move toward Romanticism, so I'm going to talk about them. Although the Capriccios or Caprices date from a couple of years before the court portrait we just saw, Goya's famous series marked a serious departure for the artist. They demonstrated his growing awareness of and his growing agreement with the social and political changes sweeping across Europe. Uh, Goya welcomed the French Revolution. He even initially welcomed Napoleon, although that, as we'll see, will change quite quickly. So here's what he wrote in his own newspaper advertisement for these prints. The subjects are chosen, I quote, from the multitude of follies and blunders common in every civil society, as well as from the vulgar prejudices and lies authorized by custom, ignorance, or interest. 
By the way, that's kind of shorthand for the church. The etching on the right, which is the most famous, seems to suggest that when reason sleeps, all sorts of terrible things emerge. So, it's a tribute to pure rationalism? Well, wait a minute. Goya wrote a caption for the print that complicates its message. The caption reads, quote, Imagination abandoned by reason produces impossible monsters. United with her, she is the mother of the arts and source of their wonders. In other words, Goya believed that imagination should never be completely renounced in favor of the strictly rational. For Goya, art's the kid that reason produces when it shacks up with imagination. One could argue that this etching gave birth to Romanticism as an art historical period, or at least offered a profound justification for this new development. Well, then came Napoleon's invasion of Spain. The supposed standard bearers of the Enlightenment had turned into violent tyrants, and the nightmares became a daily reality. No Goya oil painting made the college board list. Listen closely. You can hear howls coming up from our fellow art history teachers. But you should recognize this painting. It's all over your textbook. It's one of the most famous paintings in the history of art. And, of course, it's a magnificent example of focal point. And it's on the list Ms. Jacobs and I have given you. So let's hear the story behind this painting, which conveniently also tells us the story behind the Disasters of War series, including our required work. The first painting you'll see, by the way, the 2nd of May, was also painted by Goya. Pay special attention as you watch the video to Goya's bold, broad brushstrokes, which show up especially well in the video close-ups. These so-called loose brushstrokes, already characteristic of Velazquez's paintings, will become typical of romantic art. Goya used a technique called wet on wet. He slapped on new layers of paint before the first layer had dried. That would be especially important when painters, and we're getting there, begin painting in the outside. Goya painted the 3rd of May after Napoleon was driven from Spain and the new provincial government commissioned the work. But during the Civil War, uh, when Goya did relatively little painting, he did make sketches of things that he observed. Goya was invited to the front by one of the Spanish military leaders of the guerrilla movement. That's where the term comes from. So these are eyewitness accounts, if you will, the battlefield photography of its day. So let's watch one more quick video clip about this series and then look at the work in more detail. What do you notice about the composition? Well, this is another open composition, right, with a newly executed man falling toward us, and the man tied to the pole is presumably going to follow very soon. But what really struck me in this setup is a set of three guns peeking into the painting on the right. No soldiers, but certainly soldiers must be holding them. But still, what message does this send? War has become dehumanizing, machine-like. Uh, we're seeing the beginnings of a critique of industrialization as well here. And it's not only soldiers who are dehumanized by war. Here's another etching from the series, this time of a group of Spanish women fiercely fighting to protect themselves and their children from a group of French soldiers. The images are unrelentingly horrible. We have rape and dismemberment and starvation and unrelenting death. So let me talk about technique. You should be warned that I am venturing way out of my comfort zone. Here's where you would benefit from being taught by an art teacher rather than a history teacher. But I'm going to try. The disasters of war are etchings, which means that the artist carves the basic design into wax or a similar soft substance on a metal plate and then pours on acid to eat into the areas that have been uncovered. Etched lines are clean because the acid removes exactly those parts of the plate where the ground has been scratched away. But Goya combined etching with two other techniques, one old, one innovative. Engraving is actually an older print technique than etching. In this process, the artist uh, carves lines into the copper using one of two traditional engraving tools, a burin or a dry point needle. And by the way, uh, Goya used both in this. The burin has tra tapered rectangular ends used to carve lines directly into the metal in, and remove the copper. In dry point, instead of removing the copper from the plate completely, the artist uses a dry point needle to push the copper up into a ridge. That's what the burr is, alongside the carved line. Uh, this produces a softer, more textured line. 
Aqua tint is the new process that emerged during Goya's lifetime, and Goya was considered its first great master. Basically, the artist applies a fine dust of powdered rosin to the etching plate. The dust is heated, it bonds to the metal plate, and each dust particle forms a little speck of area that resists acid. And the plate is then bitten with acid, producing a fine texture that will hold ink. Aquatint was an innovation because before, artists could only create fields of value, that is, light and dark tone, by making hatched lines. Remember cross-hatching? Aquatint added the element of tone to the prints. Variations in tone are created by varying how long different parts of the plate are exposed to the acid. It's called aquatint so the effect, since the effect is a little bit like watercolor. I don't know if this helps, but I found these images on art supply sites. Ain't Google grand? I would have loved to find an illustration of exactly where and how each of these different printmaking techni techniques shows up on our required works. Maybe I'll have one by next year. My own art expertise isn't up to the job. I'm afraid if I tried to make these labels, I would guess them wrong. But I did find this example of the aquatint process from the earlier Goya series. Note the gradations of tone. In his old age, deaf and ill, Goya's visions became increasingly grim and macabre, very romantic. Holed up in the farmhouse outside Madrid, Goya painted a series of murals on farmhouse on his farmhouse walls that became known as his black paintings. The most famous on the left is Saturn devouring his children, which may be the very scariest painting I've ever seen in person. It's hard to look at. It's spectacular. It is ostensibly a very graphic illustration of a classical creation myth. Saturn, or Kronos, had received a prophecy that one of his children would kill him, so he devoured them while they were born. His wife, as they were born, his wife managed to save one son, that was Jupiter, who then killed his father and forced him to vomit up Jupiter's siblings, the rest of the Greco-Roman pantheon. But surely the real subject of this painting is the revolution devouring its own children. Goya painted these dark visions for himself. They were never offered for sale or publicly exhibited. Remember Goya's rendering of Judith as a bloodthirsty revolutionary woman? That, too, was one of Goya's black paintings. Meanwhile, back in France, neoclassicism lived on in David's most famous student, Angra. This canvas is nearly 17 feet long, a truly monumental work intended to awe and impress visitors to the French Academy. Like Raphael's School of Athens, on which it's clearly based, Angra's painting is a sacra conversazione, term you should probably know. It means a conversation between figures from different times. This painting didn't make the list, and for once, I have no complaints. I find Homer being crowned as a king as king of literature, a little creepy, but I wanted you to see this painting because our required painting by Angra is really not entirely typical of his work. But it's a much more interesting painting. And it also shows that Romanticism was infecting even a diehard neoclassicist such as Angra. One of Napoleon's otter military adventures was invading Egypt. It didn't end well, but Napoleon's exploits in North Africa and growing French trade with the region, which France would begin to acquire as a colony 15 years later, stimulated great interest in what the French called the exotic Orient and really in this case meant North Africa and the Ottoman Empire. It didn't hurt that Europe was awash in romantic tales of Ottoman sultans with harems filled with lovelies. And of course, it was considered okay to talk about and portray this kind of sex. These weren't civilized Europeans or Christians, right? Sex sold then as now. Basically, Angra used the exotic setting much as Renaissance painters used mythological settings. It gave their nude paintings a cloak of respectability and created a distance from the viewer. That's all going to change, by the way. Stay tuned for Monet. Uh, here's a much later Orientalist painting by Angra. Note that he still had a thing for backs. Those backs had two or three more vertebrae than any pathologist would be able to find in an autopsy. So, Orientalism is the romantic element of this painting, but the Odalisque represents rather a mishmash of styles with lots of shout-outs to earlier eras. 
Angra was a huge fan of Raphael. The Angra painting on the right, which was painted the same year as our required work, shows Raphael with his mistress. Legend had it that Raphael died young because he wore himself out uh, expressing his devotion to this young woman. Anyway, it's hard to miss the resemblance between our odalisque, the Raphael Madonna in the center, and the young lady sitting in Raphael's lap and distracting him from his work. Note, by the way, that both women stare at us rather forthrightly and that's unusual for the time. Anger's viewers found it disturbing. It's a sign of things to come. We also see mannerist elements, especially in the exaggerated length of the body. But what don't we see? What comparison am I teeing up with this detail from Goya's 3rd of May? We don't see the loose brush strokes or evocative use of color that will characterize many romantic works. Remember the argument between line and color, between Poussin and Rubens? Angra was a line guy all the way. Angra and most French Academy painters prided themselves on producing virtually invisible brush strokes. Essentially, the act of painting itself was disguised. Romantic and even more modernist painters would make the involvement of the painter much more obvious and explicit. Paintings, in a sense, became more about painting. One reason for that, as we will see, is the advent of photography. So I'm going to end today's lecture with two French painters who, more than any others, really come to, came to define Romanticism, Théodore Géricault and Eugène Delacroix. There were more past AP test questions on this painting than on any other painting from this period, but it's dropped off the list. And then it showed up on the AP test as a romanticism attribution question. Go figure. Delacroix was a friend of Jericho's. Jericho actually used Delacroix as the model for the corpse I've circled here. So note the repeated use of compositional pyramids, very common in Romantic as well as Baroque painting, and as you'll see, a feature in Liberty Leading the People as well. Jericho also employs a very open composition. This painting is spilling out of its canvas into our space. Note that this puts us where? Among the corpses. So as we'll see, does Liberty Leading the People. I'm going to show you some other Delacroix paintings in my second lecture on Romanticism, but today we'll end here with our required work and the work that made Delacroix famous, and perhaps the most iconic of all French paintings. The occasion for the painting was the Revolution of 1830. That's the revolution, by the way, that's described in Les Miserables. The revolution succeeded in bringing down the French monarchy and bringing in a more liberal and bourgeois branch of the French royal family, so it didn't actually eliminate uh, monarchy altogether. But it wasn't quite liberal enough to stomach such a revolutionary painting. Uh, it was quietly removed and would be, be decades before revolution became old news. And the figure, now de dubbed Marianne, would become the symbol of France. So I'm going to show one last uh, video clip and watch as much of it as you can. <laughs> 